as for this morning. This is on the interpretation of Scripture. Section 9 reads, the infallible rule of interpretation of Scripture is the Scripture itself. And therefore, when there is a question about the true and full sense of any Scripture, which is not manifold but one, it must be searched and known by other places that speak more clearly. The Supreme Judge, by which all controversies of religion are to be determined, and all decrees of councils, opinions of ancient writers, doctrines of men, and private spirits are to be examined, and in whose sentence we are to rest can be no other but the Holy Spirit speaking in the scripture. What we see here is that God provides for us a definitive explanation in terms of what is the final interpretation of scripture. One of the great uh, stumbling blocks for many folks today is the fact that there are all different kinds of churches out there. There's Lutheran, Methodist, Roman Catholic, Presbyterian, uh, Baptist, what have you, non-denominational, Unitarian, all kinds of different claims to be churches, and they have different points of view. Some are of rather modest differences. Presbyterians believe in the baptism of infants, the infants of believing parents, whereas Baptists do not. Baptists believe in congregational forms of government. Presbyterians believe in a Presbyterian government with uh, higher courts and plurality of, of elders and service for the church. So there are these differences within churches that uh, you, you can argue about whether they're faithful to scripture or not. Then there are differences between churches which are more fundamental. You have the differences between Reformed churches and mainline Protestant churches, which on the whole, not to say every church, but on the whole, they have drifted towards liberalism and modernism in their interpretation of the scripture. As J. Gresham Machen pointed out years ago, it is a different kind of religion at work in those churches. It's no longer Christian. It's naturalism rather than supernaturalism. It's paganism rather than theism. And so there are significant differences between these churches. It's not just a question of the interpretation of particular verses that are thorny or trying to put together different uh, verses that come to a conclusion, but these are foundational differences marking different churches, different religions. So that's a more major form of disagreement. The Roman Catholic Church is along that line, but actually the Roman Catholic Church is closer to Reformed churches than to mainline Protestant churches, in that they still recognize the authority of Scripture to a certain extent. Uh, they still believe in the, the Trinity, uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that Jesus was fully God and fully man. So they continue on the whole to uh, maintain these positions. Mainline Protestant Christianity has drifted away from that. Their view of God is more pantheistic rather than monotheist. Uh, we believe that there's one God who's distinguished from his creation, who was existed before the creation, is not dependent upon the creation, is independent of it. Mainline Protestant Church essentially teaches a kind of pantheism. You can look at the writings of Paul Tillich, a Lutheran theologian, who speaks of God as the ground of being. In other words, he's a source of life. It's kind of like going to a Star Wars movie and uh, hearing Luke Walker say, may the force be with you. That's kind of what you have in the mainline Protestant church, a kind of force at work within you. It comes to a certain personality and so forth and uh, in their views, but uh, it's distinctly different from historic Christianity and its views on the nature of God. So the interpretation of scripture here is vitally different. Mainline Protestant churches reject the historical authority, inerrancy, inspiration of Scripture. They do not believe that the original texts were without error in them. They 
were instead documents of religious people who gave witness to Revelation. They had an experience of God and a right of their experience, but they themselves were not under the superintending influence of the Holy Spirit such that everything they wrote was exactly the Word of God as God wanted to speak it. So when you have two different foundations in terms of your authority of Scripture, one a mystical experience of God that is vaguely witnessed to by a writer, and the other a God who reveals himself in Scripture and by, the, by his Holy Spirit reveals it to us through Scripture, uh, you have two different foundations, two different religions uh, following from that. So many folks out there are troubled by all these different interpretations of Scripture. And they say, well, one says this, one says that. You can't get your act together. Why bother listening to you? You're just one among many. Well, to a certain extent, we can agree with them. Why should you listen to me? I'm just one kid who grew up on Butternut Drive in Horsham, Pennsylvania. Um, why listen to me? Well, the confession gives us some guidance here uh, by noting that, first of all, Scripture itself is its own interpreter. That is to say, there is an authoritative interpretation of Scripture. It's not in particular churches, councils, creeds, what have you. It's in Scripture itself. Scripture informs us in different places of the meaning of the text of Scripture. So this morning, as we look at uh, Exodus chapter 21 for a little bit, we will examine what that particular text has to say, but we're going to look at that text in the light of other revelation given in Scripture, which will add to the, our, the full understanding of what that text says. We find that Scripture is much deeper than what you see on the surface of things. Uh, scripture has a, a depth element to it such that it, it points us not only to the present moment in our experience, not only to the past and how that has informed that present moment, but also to the future, what God would do for us in Christ. And that also informs our understanding of a text of Scripture. So the infallible rule of interpretation for Scripture is Scripture itself. So when a pastor, a teacher, speaks some rather strange things to your ears from the pulpit or in the Sunday school class or what have you, you go to Scripture. And you compare what it says with Scripture. Not only that one text, because what happens is preachers who are heretics or teaching heresy will take a verse or two, lift it out of its context, and say, this is what it means. Sometimes quite directly against the broader context of that verse within the paragraph and the scope of the chapter, and then certainly within the context of the rest of Scripture. So we always look to all of Scripture to understand any particular text of Scripture. The Confession notes that the meaning of Scripture is not manifold, but one. This is necessarily the case because God's Word is the Word of God, and His Word is consistent and true. And so there cannot be multiple interpretations such that the Word of God means something for me in this particular text, but you get something entirely different out of it for you, and what counts is not what the Scriptures say, but what I get out of the text. That's very much a modern notion today, where the interpretation of Scripture rests ultimately in the hearer. What you have in mainline Protestant churches is the idea that the, the individual who hears the, the word presented to him, uh, he interprets it for himself. And in that moment, he has a word of God for him. And when he or, or she experiences at that moment of a revelation from God may be different from what somebody else on the other side of the pew or the other side of the church is hearing and listening for themselves. So that the meaning of the text is reader-centric have to do with the person who reads or listens to that text rather than the authoritative, objective Word of God. It's very much in tune with the relativistic point of view of our age, the existentialism that is at work in our age, where uh, what counts is what I feel. And no one can really contradict 
my feelings, my experience. We have that in uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, things like this and racial issues. You can't understand my experience as a black person because you're not black. And that kind of argument is what takes place basically in theology as well in mainline churches. Again, I told this story a hundred times, but there's a mainline, there was a mainline Presbyterian preacher that I interviewed who said that his view was to help people find their own way to God. And so there's one way to God over here, another way here, there, there, up here, and we're all just finding our own way up there, and hopefully we all end up in the same place. That's the mainline point of view. The confession says that interpretation of Scripture is not manifold, but one. There's one message, one objective message to which we must listen to and heed. It can't be, you know, I feel like this and you feel like that, and that's all okay, just as long as you're sincere about it. No. There's an objective meaning to Scripture. And we must submit our minds and our hearts to that message. Believe it. Follow it. So that we might know the truth. And finally, I'll try to quickly conclude with this. That uh, we have the, the written word in, in front of us, but many people have a Bible in front of them. Your mainline Protestant preacher will have a, a Bible in front of them. You might have some of the uh, uh, some other books from the Old Testament, uh, or not the Old Testament, the Apocrypha. I was thinking Apocalypse. <laughs> the Apocrypha is in a collection of historical writings between the end of the Old Testament, Malachi, and the beginning of the New Testament in, in Matthew. And there are these historical documents that sometimes the mainline Protestant churches will have in their Bibles, and Roman Catholic churches as well. Anyway, we have this portion of the Bible all in front of us, but one person says it means this, another person says it means that, and how are we to determine it? Well, Scripture itself is its own interpreter, but also you need the Spirit of God to open your heart to see and understand what Scripture is saying. So we have two things going on here. One is the outward objective witness of Scripture to itself, explaining how we are to be made right with God, then there is that inward work of the Holy Spirit whereby He illumines our hearts and minds so that we can understand that which Scripture is saying. And so, uh, in the end, it's not what churches teach, not the tradition that the Roman Catholic Church holds to that uh, teaches the, uh, uh, the Immaculate Conception of Mary, the Assumption of Mary to Heaven, and her sinlessness and these kinds of things many, many other things, the, the uh, role of the Pope in the life of the church, all these human traditions have no place in terms of uh, the, the uh, authority of Scripture or the message of Scripture. Scripture itself is its own authority and we look to that. So uh, we'll finish here and hopefully you'll begin to see some of that at work in this morning's